It's a delight to see you today, those watching online. What a great day this has been already. Great worship segment. Woo! Come on now, I'm ready to sing. After that worship set, it is a, it is a joy to be in this church, in this place with you, and we're going to study God's Word together. It doesn't get much better than that. We're in this series called Relationship Talk, and we're going to learn today about the ultimate painkiller. So I want to pray that God would just open our hearts and minds that we could receive His engrafted Word. Father, I pray, God, that you would help me do a good job today to communicate truth, not to give my words, but your word. Lord, there are people that are here today that truly need to hear a word from you. I pray, God, that you would remove all distractions. You would let our hearts be receptive. And I pray, God, that we could take your word and live it out in our everyday lives so that we could make maximum impact for your kingdom cause and for your glory in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. 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 So the ultimate painkiller, wouldn't that be a great discovery? What is it that could alleviate our discomfort and pain? What, what, what's the most painful thing you've ever experienced? Most painful, you know, physically, what, what would that be? If we, on a scale of one to 10, I'll throw out some things. How about, how about uh, kidney stones? Is that a 10 or an eight or what is it? 11, uh, okay. Childbirth. Come on, ladies, help me out now. 12. Okay, 12, all right. Uh, all, there's, there's so many, you know, there's migraine headaches. Anybody ever suffered from cluster headaches or migraine headaches? I mean, that, they could be debilitating. Pain is, pain is, I, I hate pain, y'all. Pain hurts me. Major understatement, right? There was a husband and wife, they were arguing about which pain is the greatest and and the husband was kind of cocky and he said, he said, you're a wimp. You don't know much about pain. Wrong thing, right? Say to your wife. He said, you don't know much about pain. He said, I've, she said, I've just, you know, bored two of our children. You know, that, that's, that's pain. She goes, he said, no, that's not pain. He, she said, yeah, you need to see what that's like. And he had never experienced anything traumatic. And so it wasn't long until uh, he got kidney stones. He was trying to pass those and she's rubbing her hands. She's so excited about it. And he gets to feel the pain and it was so tough. After about two, three weeks of trying to get rid of those things, they were killing him, and he was in a moment of desperation. He cried out to God, and he said, God, please deliver, this, deliver me from this pain. Get me away from this pain. Take this pain off of me. I, I, I'd rather die than have this pain. And the Lord granted that request, and he died. And there he was uh, before the Lord, and uh, it was at the pearly gates, right? So he was at the pearly gates, and Simon Peter, he said, now there's heaven's crowded right now and a lot of people trying to get in. So this is on a point system. Just have you know that. He said, well, I want to know how many points I have. He said, well, let's see. He said, what have you done? That's good. He, he said, well, uh, Peter, I, he said, I, I, you know, I've, I've given to the poor. He said, you know, you need a hundred points. He said, I've given to the poor. He said, that's only six points. He said, man, he said, I've tithed. I've been faithful to my local church, tithes and offerings. He said, 10 points, man. He, oh, Simon Peter, he said, I haven't cussed. He said, that's only half a point. He said, man, he said, at this rate, it's going to take the grace of God to get me into heaven. And Simon Peter said, well said, well said. Come on in, you get to come into heaven. Well, that's a preacher joke, right? That's a pearly gate preacher joke. Well, anyway, but pain, you know, where does pain come from? Pain, pain is something that we want to rid from our lives it's, it's obvious that each one of us has experienced pain at some level. We go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, and you'll see the beginning of our pain and sorrow and suffering started with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God. God said, the day you eat of the tree, you will die. There'll be some things that will happen, negative events. And so now the rest is history. We, we've all inherited the sinful nature. We've inherited the, the fallen world. And so in Genesis 3, look what it says in verse 16. It says, so the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. All the ladies say, thanks, Eve, right? I'll multiply your pain in childbearing. And in pain, you'll bring forth children. Your okay, now this is where it gets tricky, y'all. Pray for me. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Okay, breathe deep. We'll pause right there. We need another pearly gate joke. Okay, you guys want this one? <laughs> we need something to soften the mood, right? So a hundred couples stood at the pearly gates. Simon Peter was there and he said, before I let all y'all in, I'm going to separate the, the wives from the husbands. Wives, you step back. Husbands, step forward. I have two lines. 
Got one line here. This line is for all the husbands that have been ruled by their wives. You get in this line. And in this line, these are for all the godly husbands who have learned to lead strong and lead faithfully to lead their families well. All the men begin to shuffle around. The wives step back. And 99 men stood in the line that represented them being ruled by their wives. And this one guy stood in the line that was saying, you know, I've ruled my house well. I've been a faithful leader, a faithful father, father, faithful husband. I've led strong. Simon Peter was amazed. He talked to this guy. He said, man, you have rocked it. Thumbs up to you. Kudos to you. Like, this is a, like, dude, how did you lead so strong? How did you lead so faithfully? The guy said, I don't know anything about that. All I know is my wife told me to get in this line. <laughs> now, I told that service, I told that joke in first service. My wife is here, and she gave me permission to use it in this service. <laughs> all right. All right. Enough with all the jokes. Okay. <laughs> What are we talking about? Okay, let's go back to the Word of God. We're reading the Word of God. So, he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. The command that I that said, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. And in pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Now, here we see right in the Word of God where pain comes from. Why we struggle with pain so much. Why pain is such an object lesson for us to learn what it means to grow in life and to mature. And God uses pain. He uses pain as a medium by which He can grow us and make us more like Him. You know, love is an interesting thing when it comes to, to pain because love opens you up and makes you vulnerable. We're talking about love this month. Love, love makes you more susceptible to being wounded or being hurt. And yet love is the very thing that can actually heal the hurt. And that's the thesis of today's sermon. And that is mature love heals every hurt. That seems like a, a paradox, right? It seems like an oxymoron. But when you look at God's love story and you see how Jesus was wounded, how he experienced the hurt and the shame and the pain that came from the cross securing our eternal salvation, you can also understand that when you look at God's love story, we see the recipe on how we can overcome the struggles that we face in this life. And, and so in order to have God's mature love working in our lives according to Scripture, we need to open ourselves up and be vulnerable, take the risk. There's always, you step out on a limb when you say, I'm going to love. Love the unconditional kind of love. You're going you're gonna to risk rejection. You're going to risk burnout. There's so many risks that, that you have to take if you're going to truly mature in love. So the gospel helps us suffer well. How are you suffering? Are you suffering well? Are you wasting your suffering by just pining away about it or, or griping about it? Or are you just coping with the pain? Or are you using that as, as a mechanism to push you forward so that you can help others with their pain? What's your theology, right? What's your theology of suffering? The Bible talks a lot about suffering. Why? Because we will suffer. It's, it's inevitable that we will suffer. And you say, well, I'm suffering and I don't see how it can get any worse. Don't say that because it, it can get worse. And I don't say that to be negative. That's just life. So we have to go to scripture and see, see the secret of, of dealing with the difficult issues in life so that we can be strong in all of our relationships at home, on the job, in the neighborhood, at church. We want to be mature in our relationships. So your theology of, of suffering will really bear you up in times of difficulty. Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, um, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at this, verses 3 through 9. This is powerful. This is Paul's theology of suffering. He said it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, look what it says, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For, we, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share 
in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened. I, I know many of us have been there, right? So utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Wow, these are powerful words from the Apostle Paul. This is his theology of suffering because in this we see, we see that it's informational. We see that it's transformational and it's missional. We get the information that, yeah, there's going to be sufferings. And there's going to be a God of comfort that comes and helps us. But there's also this transformation as our hearts are transformed and as our hearts are, are as, we, as we receive God's comfort, we're able to then move into a missional mindset where I want to comfort somebody else. I want to help somebody else as they go through their time of difficulty. So it's like a chain reaction here. So are you biblically prepared for pain? Are you biblically prepared for suffering? Because if it's not happening now in your life, get ready because it will come. And God wants you to be prepared so that that can, that can be used for his glory and other people can be impacted by your story. Are you capable of ministering right now to others who, who are in suffering mode right now? These are, these are important questions that we need to ask ourselves. I've got four main points from 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. Look what it says here. It says that love, in verse 7, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says, this is amazing. It says that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. How, how is this even possible? I, I, love is not a frilly sentiment. It's not a wishy-washy emotion. Love is powerful. It's tough. And so, the first point is that love bears all things. Because of mature love, you're going to be able to put up with anything. That's really what it's saying. To just have thick skin and a tender heart. You're able to just put up with it. All the stuff that's thrown at you in life, you're just going to deal with it. There are some people I know that are extra sensitive to pain. I remember growing up with a, a guy, a friend of mine, a really good friend, that super sensitive to pain. I'm not joking, y'all. You're going to think I'm, I'm lying. I'm not. I mean, he would, this is a, an example. He'd like, oh, let me see here. And like, oh, mm. he was just, I mean, just so sensitive to pain. I said, dude, that didn't hurt you. And he'd pick up a, like a pillow or something. Oh, pull my arm. literally, we play, play basketball and he was always calling fouls. And, and, you know, if you're playing street ball, you're going to be hacked. You're going to be fouled. It's like, no, no big deal. This guy, you, you get a couple in, it's like, ow, oh, man, you fouled me. So there's some people that are extra sensitive to pain. I get that. There's some people that are clinically uh, diagnosed as being extra sensitive to pain. So I'm not going to minimize that. There, there's, there's, there's physical pain, there's emotional pain, there's mental pain that we all experience. And there's different ways that we deal with that pain in order to numb the pain. There's some people that use drugs and alcohol to make the pain go away. Some people, you know, use food and comfort food, and, and, and they, they, want to, they want the pain to go away. There's some people that go to entertainment, and, and they're just trying to get their mind off of the pain. Some people would take their lives in order to take away the pain. And so I just want you to pause just for a minute and, and ask yourself, do I have the biblical perspective on how I should deal with my pain? What's God's remedy? What's the, what's the antidote? You know, you go through a divorce. That is painful. You have a death of a loved one. Maybe you're suffering from a disease. There are some people in our church that are going through a tough time right now, some, you know, with cancer or other ailments, and, which can be so debilitating, and, and the, the emotional pain and, and the physical pain that comes along with that. So how can, we, how can we stay in the race? How can we not quit? How can we not give up? Because it's so tempting to want to give up when you're in your darkest hour. When you're struggling, when you when you have all this going on in your life. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, gives us some insight on how to, have the kind of, how to have the kind of life that deals with pain the right way. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 2. We're going to start there. 
The secret is to keep your eyes on Jesus. And we started 2020, right, with eyes on him. That was our series, keeping our eyes on the Lord. And I'm sure that we took our eyes off the Lord in 2020. And we, you know, a lot of the struggles in life, we maybe we still haven't focused our, our attention on Jesus. And so here, let's look at it. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. I love that way this reads in the message paraphrase here. It says, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. When you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through. And that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. What an amazing read. As we fixate on Jesus, as we look to Jesus and what he went through, we're going to be able to get through our struggles in life. We're going to be able to push through every barrier, push through every obstacle. Because if Jesus could plow through all of the hatred and all the meanness that was inflicted on him as he suffered for our sins, so can we you know, grin and bear it. So, th- so can we grow in mature love and God's love and we can put up with just about anything. Sometimes we get weak in our faith and sometimes we, you know, we doubt God's existence or we doubt God's providence. But if we understand the true meaning of God's love and that he loves us unconditionally, then we can, we can just grow in that and we'll have the thick skin. We'll have the tender heart. We'll be nicer we, we, we won't be so quick to lash back or lash out at people who, who do us wrong. We're, we're able to move on and forgive them and love them and be patient with them in that process. Here's the next point. Because of God's love and maturing in that love, you can believe that it's all good. And I know this is a tall order. I know this is difficult, but I'm here to say that it's all good. It's all good. If you're a believer, if you love the Lord, it's all good. God's working behind the scenes. No matter how difficult it may seem, no matter it seems like it's, it's, it's just pitch black and you're feeling so low, you're broken on the inside. It's all good. God is a, a God of love. As we say, well, who is God? What is God? Well, God is love. The Bible says God is love. And the Bible also says that God is good. We just sang a song about God being a good, good father. So when we doubt God's goodness, and we doubt that he's a good, loving father. We question our struggles that we go through. But Romans 8, 28, you all know that famous verse of scripture? It, it says that, but we know that all things, come on somebody, we know that all things work together for our good, work together for good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. What a rich verse of scripture. Something that you can hold on to. When we go through tough times, we're tempted to feel sorry for ourselves. And and instead of building, instead of maturing, instead of growing from it, we're tempted to feel debilitated and defeated and and despondent. We lose heart. It's almost impossible to believe in these moments that God has good intentions for us. When, When we mature in God's love and when we really get it, we can say in our struggle, it's all good. I don't like it. I don't, I don't want it, but it's someday going to work for my good because this is the loving God that we serve. Everything that has happened in your life up to this point has been for your development and for your training. And the same with me. This life is but a dressing room for eternity. We're living not just for the here and now. We're, here, we're, we're living for the, for the later. We're living for that eternity with the Lord. Look in in Hebrews chapter 12 again. Let's pick up in verse four. It says, in this all out match against sin, others have suffered far worse than you to say nothing of what Jesus went through, all that bloodshed. So don't feel sorry for yourselves or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God, God regards you as his children. My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline But don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. God loves you enough 
God loves me enough to not let any of us self-destruct with ego, with pride. He, he allows the problems of life to humble us and to keep us in a right place so that we can truly, you know, beloved, think it not strange, as the writer says, the fiery trial. I think it was Peter, first Peter. Don't think it strange, that fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing is happening. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. I mean, this is God's word for us today. This is, this is how we can really learn to live the kind of life that brings glory to God in the, in the most difficult circumstances. Here's the third one. Because of, of maturing in God's love, you're able to expect a bright future. You know, so love bears all things. In other words, you can put up with anything. Love believes all things. You, know, you, just, you just know that it's all good. And then love hopes all things. You're, you're, you're living the expectant kind of life. You're not looking at worst case scenarios. You, you believe that it's, it's, it, God is not just working for your good, but he's going to work for what is best for you and best for me. If you know this, if you, if you know this in, in your heart, if you receive this in your heart, you, you won't be a dropout. You won't quit along the way. You won't throw in the towel. You won't, be a, you won't be a quitter. Look at Hebrews 12 again. Let's, let's look at verse 7. It says, God is educating you, right? That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. This trouble you're in isn't punishment. It's training. The normal experience of children. Only irresponsible parents leave their children to fend for themselves. Would you pr prefer irresponsible God? We respect our own parents for training and not spoiling us. So why not embrace God's training so we can truly live? While we were children, our parents did what seemed best to them. But God, but God is doing what is best for us, training us to live God's holy best. I encourage you today to dive into Scripture, study God's Word. There may be someone right now, you're watching online and you're thinking, I, I'm about ready to give up. I'm ready to lose all hope. I, 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 just, I just feel that this is a time right now where a lot of people are tempted to quit, to give up, or take matters in their own hands. But trust the Lord. Believe that God has your best interest at heart, no matter what you're in. And you're going to pull through, and it's going to be worth it all. I, I'll say it again. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. I know that, that when you give that initial investment, sometimes you, you want to Buy and then you want to sell, but you really want to buy and hold, right? If, you're, if we're going to look at this as a stock market, you, it's an early investment, but you're here for the long haul. There's going to be some ups and downs. It feels like I better cash in. No, hold on because there is a maturity. There is, a, there is a, there's an eternal weight or value that's multiplying. It's growing. It's going to be worth it. Trust me, it's going to be worth it. Here's my fourth and final point, and that is, as you mature in God's love, you're able to know that pain means more gains. Plural. Not just gain, but gains. Those that are bodybuilders, those that are even, that, that like to lift weights, know that, that gains are what it's all about. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you that are so strong and mighty, you know, my son was trying to get me to lift weights the right way, and I need to lift weights. I, but, you know, guys, I don't like to go to the gym. It, it, pain hurts me. I said that earlier, right? But if you, if you want to build muscle and if you want the kind of muscle that, that, that eats fat, and that's what they say, if you, it's the muscle that burns the fat. So I'm, I'm lifting weights like this. And my son says, uh, to do it this way. So I don't even know what this is called. So it's awkward. I go down and I'll, and I, and I'll do this and the curls, and then I go up with it and then back and just do that. I think he said 500 times. And then my my daughter's boyfriend, Adam, he's doing these new things. They're called glute killers or whatever. And I'm not going to do that. That's dumb. <laughs> what are we talking about here? We're talking about, you know, when you're building your muscle, you're really having to tear the muscle, right? You're, the muscle is being torn down so that it builds back up. So the more pain, more gains. We look at Jesus and we see the struggle, the endurance. 
enduring the cross. Why? For the joy that was set before him, the writer of Hebrews says. The joy that was set before him. He saw you and I. Scott, he saw us. He saw your family sitting on the front row here. Matt, you and Jackie, he, he sees us. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. More pain, more gains. He got us. This is amazing to me. It's beautiful. It's almost too good to be true. The story of God's love is not that Jesus just died, was buried and rose again. There's, he, he experienced pain. He embraced the pain. Let me prove it to you. It's in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 27. This is so amazing. It's, this is on the way from Jerusalem to Golgotha. Probably the Via Della Rosa is that pathway to the cross, pathway to, to where he was killed. And on the way, they, the guy named Simon carried the cross for Jesus. Jesus had already been whipped and beaten, crowned with thorns, beard pulled out, just awful. And arriving at Golgotha, the place they call the skull, they offered him a mild painkiller. It was a mixture of wine and myrrh, wine and gall. And myrrh and gall are both the same thing. And it, it is a it's a painkiller. And when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. Now later on the cross, he asked for a drink and they gave it to him and it was something different. And that's when he said, it is finished after he drank that. But here, they gave him this drink with, it was a painkiller and, you know, he's, I would say, hey, take the painkiller. You're, you're gonna die, you're bleeding out. You're sacrificing yourself for the sins of the world. That's good enough. See, he wouldn't let him kill the pain because he was going to kill our pain. He wouldn't take the painkiller because he's going to be our painkiller. By his stripes, we are healed, right? Mature love heals every hurt. The deep scars, the emotional hurt, the pain that we all experience, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit affects us in a deep and a profound way. So Jesus refused that painkiller. That moves me deep. You know, the gospel story is not just to get our minds engaged in theological discussion, but it's really to capture our hearts. The fact that Jesus didn't just bleed, but he literally felt such excruciating pain. You know, the, of all things, you know, Rome created this cross. They invented the aqueduct. They invented toilets. They invented running water, so many things. They were, they were conquering the whole world at that time. Very inventive. They were a war machine. They created these amazing ways to fight people and torture people. And the cross was really considered the most painful form of death because it prolongs the death. It makes it last a long time. Although so Jesus, the Son of God, chose to come at a time, the worst of times, right? If I if I, was the son of, if I were the son of God, I would come maybe in modern times where there's just an electric chair. I wouldn't have chosen to come at the time of the cross. But that was, that was God's intent from the foundation of the world. He's the lamb slain from the beginning of time. In Psalm 22, it says, they pierced my hands and feet, which is a prophecy of Christ being nailed to the cross. There wasn't even crucifixions going on at the time that was written. So it, it, was, a, it was all planned. He came to experience pain. This is the love story. This is, how, this is how, we, how much He loves us, how we know how much He loves us. Just taking the pain. Jesus told a parable, I think it's the shortest parable, and it is the parable of the merchant who was seeking price, you know, very valuable pearls, pearls that were of a high cost, and he found this one pearl it was more valuable than all of them. So he sold everything to buy this one pearl. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to this. And I've heard this parable. I've read it. And I always thought that, that Jesus is the pearl and we are the merchant and we sell out to get him. And that's true. But I think it's, it, it's the, it starts the other way around. I think we are the pearl. I think Jesus is the merchant. And he's looking for the people of great value and he gave everything to get that one pearl. I think the church is the pearl. We're the church, right? Because he first loved us, now we love him. He first valued us. We're his treasure, but now he's our treasure. We were his pearl, now he's our pearl. 
I, I think that's so amazing about the parables of Jesus because they're so dynamic and multi-layered. Pearls are interesting anyway, right? Back in the day, pearls were considered of more value than even rubies, diamonds, and emeralds, or even gold. You know, when you, when you get a diamond, a ruby, or emerald, you get it from the rock or the sand or the, the earth. But pearls are different. Pearls are the product of pain. Of all the jewels, it's the only jewel that is the result of, of pain because a tiny sand or rock slips into an oyster and it's an irritant. It, 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 it actually injures the oyster. And so the oyster's reaction is it secretes fluids that surround that sand or that pebble and it builds up over time. And I just read just the other day that, that most pearls, the cheaper ones take six months of suffering for that oyster. The more, the more valuable ones take up to four to six years that that oyster has to suffer so that a woman can wear that pearl on a string of pearls around her neck. Pearls are the product of pain. Okay, we get that. Maybe that's why the writer in Revelation speaks of heaven's entrance or we cross the finish line. We're gonna see these pearly gates or gates of pearl because those who walk through those gates are people that have experienced the trials, experienced the losses, the suffering. You get it. And it's not a corny preacher's joke either. It's not just a pearly gate joke. No, it's real. I made it. It's been worth it all. All the struggle, all the pain, all the misfortune in life. I'm here. I want to encourage you with that word today because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, it says that this light affliction that works just for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory beyond human understanding, beyond comparison. In you right now, the suffering that you're experiencing is developing you and making you who you're going to be for eternity. And I say, thank you, Jesus. Father, we want to pause just for a moment and reflect on the struggles that we've gone through. Maybe the struggles that we're in right now. Maybe someone that's watching today at home just been ready to give up. I thank you for reminding us how Jesus is the ultimate painkiller. When we look to him and we see how he was able to endure it, we can hold on and not give up ourselves. I pray for everyone in this room. I pray, God, as we look to you today, that you would give us that assurance and that hope that it's going to be worth it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen.